both the hats. Uh, welcome to this very lovely morning here in Pune. And uh, welcome to the 17th edition of Automotive Supply Chain Conference. It is my pleasure to welcome you all for this conference. And let me extend or let me begin with starting and a welcome to all, not only here at the panel, but also all of you, the participants in this conference for the day. Let me start with welcoming Mr. Anshuman Sina, partner AT Karni. Partner with Karni, Mr. Sina leads automotive transportation and infrastructure practice in India. He has advised clients across transportation, logistics, and infrastructure industries across private sector, public sector, and the government. Let me also extend my warm welcome to Mr. Kiran Vedya, Managing Director, Auto Cluster Development and Research Institute, ACDRI, and Pimpri Chinchwad Startup Incubation Center, PCSIC. He has 25 years of industry working experience in various multinational companies in senior positions and for the last five years is heading the ACDRI and PCSIC organizations. I also take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Aminash Chintawar, Managing Director, Bosch, Chassis Systems India Private Limited. He comes with 38 years of experience with this very big automotive supplier. He has strong international experience dealing with large manufacturing division in Germany in high precision fuel injection products, international production network, and supply chain. I take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Diliraj Dabole, Deputy Director General Foreign Trade, Pune. He was working as the Assistant Commissioner Sales Tax at Kolhapur and then he joined Indian Trade Service in 2015. Currently, he is posted in Pune as Deputy Director General Foreign Trade Services. Let me also extend my warm welcome to Mr. Vineet Majgaonkar. Member CII National Committee on Logistics and Chairman Armstrong Dematic. He is again known as a very prominent innovator and senior leader in the intra logistics automation industry. He has been in this high tech automation industry for 27 years, including 20 years of Armstrong and two years of senior leadership at a German board. Some of you, for you whom if uh, CII Institute of Logistics uh, may not be known, CII Institute of Logistics, known as CII IL, established by CII as a center of excellence, it plays a very vital role in accelerating growth and improving competitiveness in the logistics and supply chain sector. Through its services, it elevates the Indian supply chain performances to new heights by setting up a sustainable ecosystem through stakeholder engagement and global network. At a personal level, I can see a lot of uh, initiatives which have post-pandemic, in fact, a uh, lot of work and new work and new initiatives, path-breaking initiatives are being undertaken under CII Institute of Logistics. It runs education programs. It has certified more than one lakh students and industry professionals in the last two decades. It has partnered with various universities across the country. Content is designed, developed, and delivered by industry professionals like you. 60% of the learning curriculum is delivered through hands-on learning in the industry. It has also tied up with LSCM certification programs with Japan, Singapore, and UK. CII School of Logistics is India's first industry-led, industry-managed, and industry-absorbed logistics school. School offers competency-based MBA in logistics and supply chain, supply chain analytics at MIT, at Noida, Mumbai, and Kolkata campuses. Supply Chain and Logistics Excellence Awards, some of you may be exposed to that, scale awards are uh, very aspirational awards. Once a year, this year, I think it is happening in December, in 2023 at uh, Bangalore. This award evaluates and recognizes excellent, exemplary, eminent organizations analyzing maturity model performance, model performance metrics in both manufacturing and logistics services sectors. Over the last nine years, 2,000 plus organizations have contested and 700 plus organizations have won scale awards. This 10th edition is on 1st of December at Bangalore. My pleasure to invite every one of you to participate and celebrate in this success. Also, there are four other initiatives. I'm sure we are around. We can help you with 
membership in MOVE, Warehouse National Network, Women's Logistics Leadership, Technology Automation and Robotics. All of these are very active uh, groups which work on specific agendas. I would call all the industry members to join hands in these initiatives and contribute towards logistics movement. <coughs> now coming up to the subject of the conference today, this is the 17th edition of supply chain conference specifically on automotive sector. The automotive industry, as all of you know, is constantly evolving and the supply chain is no exception. In the past three years, the global and Indian automotive supply chain has faced multiple disruptions, initially on account of COVID and then due to commodity pressures arising from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Indian automotive industry has seen growth matching pre-pandemic levels in passenger vehicles reaching pre-pandemic growth levels and commercial vehicle sales reaching close to its peak of 2018 and 19. This EVs obviously remain an important area of focus. At the same time, global macroeconomics continues to face turbulent weather. Global central banks continue to tighten policy. We are seeing very high inflation around the world, a lot of employment challenges. We are seeing manufacturing shifting, China plus one. I'm sure you have, all of you are fully conversant with what is going around. With this ongoing transformation in the automotive industry, global and national macroeconomic headwinds, emergence of newer components, automotive supply chain will be expected to improve responsiveness to the new evolving demand patterns. This continued focus on technology adoption while maintaining equal focus on sustainability poses a fresh set of challenges as well as opportunities. And today the conference will cover, therefore, the three important subjects that all of us are concerned with. First is the building demand, sensing and responsiveness. The second is balancing efficiency and sustainability. And the third one is embracing advanced technologies. May I now request Mr. Anshuman Sina, partner Kearney Consulting India, to deliver the theme address. Mr. Sina. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, thank you, Session Chair, for giving, giving us this opportunity. Um, so uh, at the outset, uh, I must uh, say that uh, it's very nice to be back in this room again. I think three years, for the last three years, we were doing this virtually. It just doesn't have the same uh, thing as being together and talking about these topics. Uh, I was also thinking about, uh, you know, uh, when uh, they were introduced this as the 17th year. So I've been, uh, I've been coming here for the last eight to nine years. So it's kind of 50% of this time um, uh, I've been associated. And I've seen how uh, some of these themes uh, that we talk about actually reflect the changes that we see in our industry all the time, right? Uh, uh, I remember when we had, in 16 and 17, there was a lot of discussion we were doing on uh, how the supply chain becomes much more tech-enabled, uh, much more, let's say, digital in, in its adoption. The, uh, in the themes in 2020, 2021, of course, the, the, there was an overhang of pandemic which, which, we, uh, which nobody could ignore. Uh, but we also talked about uh, the uh, pressure on ESG compliance, pressure on environmental sustainability. So the, in some ways, the, the, the themes uh, over the years have also reflected you know, the zeitgeist, right? So what has been going on uh, in and around us? Uh, and that's what we tried to capture with the with the theme this time as well. Uh, and again, reflecting back to a year back, a year ago, uh, when we were doing this, uh, I must say that, uh, uh, you know, broadly, uh, while the pandemic was not yet over, but we were kind of on its last legs. Uh, and there was a sense of optimism, which was a little bit unheralded, in the sense that all of us thought that the growth is now here to stay. We are behind, the tough times are behind us, and now... All of us can just focus on growth, you know, families are taken care of, health is taken care of, just focus on growth and the industry uh, will move forward. And then, of course, the events of uh, late 2022 around inflation, uh, around, of course, the impact of the war and those things started to kick in. Uh, and then, therefore, when we were thinking about the theme for this, uh, this event, we felt that uh, there is a little, uh, there, it's a little bit of a back of, uh, you know, uh, a back. Uh, we are in somewhat, we have been pulled back in terms of the uncertainty. There is much more volatility now uh, than it was probably a year, year and a half back. Uh, 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 there is a little bit more of a sense of cautiousness among the industry, among the supply chains, of course, among the governments as well. And that is clearly visible in terms of 
the financing that's available or the, even the cost of financing that, uh, that I'm sure all of you also uh, uh, go through those dilemma. So how do we now think about the way forward for the industry in this environment where there is much more volatility than before? Uh, perhaps the sense of optimism that we had a year, year and a half back coming out of the pandemic has kind of tempered. So now we are thinking a little bit more practically about how we take the industry forward. Uh, so that was really the genesis of how we came up with the theme for this year. And that's what you know the, the three uh, topics that you will all go through through the rest of the day. Hopefully capture some thoughts uh, that all of us can go back with uh, in terms of how do we make some of those changes in our uh, corporate relationships in our, our day to day work, working. So that's a little bit of a background of you know how, how we came about with uh, the theme for this year. So I'll start first with uh, you know just a, a picture, giving you a picture of what the uh, uh, and in some ways an illustration of the volatility bit. If you see, uh, I mean, while it's true that pandemic did take a significant hit on the industry, but the sales were actually already down globally. From 2017, the automotive industry globally was already down by about 2 to 3%. Uh, it was a slow decline, exacerbated by different factors. This is at a global level, so it's sort of a balance between what was happening in India-China versus what was happening in, let's say, the western part of the world. Of course, there was a 14% shock in 2020 uh, and a very sharp rebound in 2021. But then again, there was a little bit of a tempering in 2022, right? And that's the point around volatility, that there's just no way to kind of know which way uh, or conclusively feel that this is the way that things will move forward. Uh, there is an expectation that now things should become a little bit more stable. But if you notice the absolute numbers, we catch up to 2017 only in 2027. So in some ways, the auto industry has lost a decade of growth uh, if we are being completely objective about the impact that is, that is created because of this uh, pandemic. Of course, that has a knockoff effect on what happens to the supply chains, what happens to the service providers. Um, even and the other chart that you see on the bottom left shows where the GDP growth is expected to be. Uh, no surprises there. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a much slower uh, sort of a rebound phase over the next four to five years as we get out of this inflationary environment. Uh, you know, hopefully the war is behind us soon uh, and then we can all get on overall uh, industry progress that is being thought through. So that's the, that's the that's a context that we see and even the data supports uh, the context that this is just too much of swings, you know, year on year, minus 13, plus 4, minus 2.5, then again plus 3%. Uh, there are just too much, too much changes that are happening. Uh, and from your context, all of you are part of global supply chains, so you also have to be mindful of what do you do for Indian companies, and even the globally the growth is very two-paced, not every economy is going at the same pace. Uh, so your supply chains are also, uh, I would say, uh, I mean the volatility in your, your uh, forward supplies are different in, in different parts, no matter, uh, driven more by how much diversified your uh, portfolio is in terms of global uh, presence. So that's the environment in which all of us are, that's the environment in which we are, uh, we are uh, uh, operating. And, and therefore, for that, we said uh, that, you know, uh, we use this forum with, you know, so much of uh, industry knowledge, so much of industry depth that's available to talk about these three, uh, these, these three areas. First is to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how does this demand volatility gets translated in our day-to-day -day lives, right? So, uh, of course, the most obvious implication is in terms of how does the inventory get managed, uh, how does the, uh, let's say, travel times or the, or the commitment, committed timelines of delivery get, get affected. Uh, but how, how are those to be managed from a service provider side is, is, is the theme that we are trying to, uh, trying to talk about in point number one. Uh, and I'll show you a few examples for each of these three in terms of how, how we are seeing you know, things happening outside, outside India as well. So that's theme number one, which is uh, how, do, how does active uh, demand volatility, volatility gets managed so that as service providers, our financials don't get stretched and our service levels don't get stretched because the demand on the other side is just a little too unpredictable. Uh, the second point, and the uh, uh, chair uh, also alluded to it, is in, ter in terms of sustainability. Uh, and I think all of us can agree on this in this room, in this August conference, that it's no longer a buzzword. It is a very real thing. It's a very real requirement. Uh, part of it is originated by our own boards, but also by what our customers are demanding because we are scope three for them. So uh, for them to manage their investors and their shareholders, the commitments they have given, there is an expectation that the service providers must also comply, uh, who don't have the same muscle, the same firepower, the same uh, financial ability or necessarily. So how do, how do we handle some of these uh, aspects? Because this is a very real, a very tangible change that is being asked of all the service providers. Uh, and the third one is around technology. And this is, of course, technology is a sort of a very macro used word, but what I wanted to talk about was more in the context of technology in the provisioning of service prov uh, providers. So there's not so much about technology on the line or how do automotive companies do, but more from a supply chain uh, point of view. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, this is, I, I would say, one, one area where, in some ways, the progress that has happened uh, in, 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 in some, some areas is, has far exceeded, uh, for example, the, uh, you know, even the expectations of how the OEMs are uh, uh, wanting to move. So I would say this is one area where, in fact, the supply chain service providers are actually moving much faster, perhaps, even than the OEMs are ready. So they are actually offering solutions. Uh, they are actually offering uh, ideas. And it's the OEMs who are catching up to things, saying, yes, this looks good. And you know, for warehouse management, uh, this looks like a good idea for, for us to adopt. So that's where, obviously, we have taken the lead. The key is, obviously, to make it cost effective uh, and for the technology to actually start to generate ROI, right? So it's not just tech for tech's sake, but tech to generate meaningful ROI, tech to generate meaningful use cases, uh, which, again, adds value to uh, your, your customers as well as your, uh, your uh, uh, suppliers. So those are the three themes that, that will be covered through, uh, through the course of today. I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot of some thought process around uh, what was the intention of, of bringing it up and which supported with some examples that we see from the industry. Uh, so the first one, which is on the, on the demand uh, volatility. So the chart on the right hand side shows you a little bit of the picture of you know, the, the trend of uh, month, month, month on month growth uh, over a period of three years. And you can see how, 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 it, how it has swung. Very similar to the overall automotive demand chart that you saw at the start. And that obviously translates back to what happens in the overall uh, supply chain. Uh, complexity keeps on going up because EVs have a completely different supply chain. Uh, India is obviously one of the large uh, markets as far as two-wheelers are concerned. But then Europe is much larger as far as four-wheelers are concerned. China is much larger as far as buses are concerned. So this is just a sig like this, gr this growth is manifesting itself in very different segments in different geographies. But that, from a service provisioning side, it keeps on adding to the uh, to the complexity. Uh, of course, the macroeconomic recoveries are not the same. So uh, therefore, the type of growth and uh, how much forward stocking you do versus how much uh, is held at the supplier and uh, at, the, at, the, at the origin point keeps on varying. Uh, and of course, since the uh, recovery over the last year after COVID, the inventory overhang continues to exist. So we see that also getting reflected in a lot of press that talks about demand volatility. I, I think three, three, three main things that, that need to be uh, thought through here. Uh, in terms of how this gets managed. One is, one is that uh, previously, uh, you know, until the last decade, per, almost a lot of the data that was shared was a little bit on a need, need basis. So the SNOP plans, a lot of it was on Excel and spreadsheets as well. Uh, how does that data sharing among different stakeholders become much more organized? And I'll give you a couple of examples of that uh, in, uh, down in a couple of slides. Um, how are you leveraging your own uh, data analytics better to predict the future? in terms of you know, whether it is seasonal variations, whether it is the, the need to deploy different types of fleets uh, for different type of uh, requirements. Uh, also, the type of storage requirements that you would have from time to time. So how is that helping you optimize uh, your uh, ability to service the needs from your customers? Uh, and ultimately, the capacity has to, be, uh, has to be able to flex. So it's not just that it's a fixed capacity that's, that you are stuck with. But, uh, and that then translates down to your own operating models with your service providers. So what sort of flex you can build uh, with them so that on-demand uh, inventory storage or on-demand service provision can be, uh, can be made available. In fact, uh, as an aside, uh, uh, at, uh, at Carney, which is a firm I represent, uh, we've, we actually developed a, a, a tool called Sense and Pivot, which in fact does exactly some of this, which is uh, actually predicting, looking at the demand, and then pivoting the supply chains to react to the demand. Of course, it is developed more for, let's say, consigners, not so much for the, sh but the shippers, but the origin of the uh, the tool was precisely this, that can we make people, can we make supply chains more responsive, uh, knowing the data that we have, which perhaps we didn't have as much, uh, as much before. So that's theme number one, which is in terms of uh, how do you manage the volatility in the demand with the tools that you have at your hand, but also the tools that OEMs have uh, that they can help you, uh, help you with. Uh, the second theme is uh, uh, what I talked about in terms of sustainability. Uh, now, in the early days, and in some ways we are still in the early phase of sustainability as a topic, being seeped in, where right now it almost seems like a choice. Either we can choose to be more efficient and cost effective, or we can choose to be sustainable and a little bit more uh, expensive. But then who pays for you know, the extra carbons which are not emitted? Uh, but uh, having said that, there is, there is a pressure that is actually originating from the OEMs, and if not already, will translate. I'm sure all of you are, 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 are part of those conversations. 
uh, are already translating to their supply chain. So the examples of you know, ultralight packaging. So BMW, for example, uh, is moving to adopting what is called as EPP, the ext uh, uh, on polypropylene side, which uses almost 25% uh, recyclable material. Typical polypropylene has less than 10%. So the more recyclable material goes that goes into it, the obviously the more sustainable, the closer it, be it, it uh, trans becomes to sustainability. And that's a mandate that's right now being rolled out in Europe, but at some point of time, it will also become a part of their global supply chains once the uh, use case is completely proven. Uh, similarly, for example, uh, you know, some of you, uh, as part of Hyundai and Kia supply chain, there's a very clear uh, guidelines document that lay out what is the expectation of uh, sustainable uh, practices from service providers, right? So not just what they do on their line, but what is it that they expect from all of you, which is in terms of transportation or in terms of storage, uh, almost defining the KPIs of sustainability for even the service providers. And it's a very nicely laid, laid out sort of 15-page document, uh, which clearly outlines the way the company has thought about how it wants to uh, take all of the service providers on uh, on that journey. Uh, the third example is in terms of uh, you know even the OEMs actually switching choice, uh, sw uh, switching uh, their logistics to more sustainable choices. So Volkswagen example as well as BMW here. Uh, I think uh, Volkswagen ran the first trial uh, about six, seven or eight months back uh, of uh, ships that ran on vegetable oil. Right. So it's a vegetable oil residue. What is the cooking oil? Whatever is left over that being blended with the marine oil. Now these were argue, uh, admittedly, these are short runs, so Germany to Ireland, Spain to Portugal, uh, not necessarily meant for the long, long haul yet, but the point is that once these things get into test phase, improvements will kick in and they will eventually start to uh, also be uh, rolled out globally. Uh, and more importantly, it gets translated to, it starts to get translated into the way their RFPs are going to be written or the way they will expect their service providers to. Uh, actually adopt to it. So these are all different examples, but all of them under the same broad umbrella of uh, how the OEMs are kind of tightening up. Uh, and uh, if not in a formal written RFP, but at least as a capability, uh, as a distinguishing capability, it will become a part of uh, what they expect their service providers to, to comply with. So that, therefore, that, that's, that's what the th thought is that in the second uh, theme session today, we do a little bit of deep dive of the sustainable practices and how is it that the industry uh, can help the, their customers comply. Uh, and the last one is on uh, technology. As I said, the, uh, the thought process is not new. It's been, and you know, when, when I was doing this in 2016, even then we were talking about uh, this. Uh, the key is, uh, or the difference really is that this is super mainstream, right? So, right? so there, it's, not, it's no longer a cool pilot in one small, you know, 10,000 square feet of a warehouse, or a cool pilot on one OD lane with one particular truck. Uh, or, or run on one particular month, but like real mainstream. So it's being deployed. Uh, and when the, for example, the Catena X, uh, the automotive network was formed, again, largely originating from European OEMs, but translating to uh, the service providers globally. It was intended to be a data sharing platform that ultimately helps everybody, uh, A, get a very clear view of the inventory, the logistics requirements, uh, but also helping in the, which, which in some ways saves, uh, 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 saves wastage and in, in improves transparency. But eventually it also helps, for the company it also helps in better price discovery, a better understanding of uh, the, the entire uh, information that is available in the system, which is then mined for, let's say, more useful uh, outcomes from there. Uh, so, you know, whether it is BMW using uh, part chain for uh, for uh, sharing information with their serv service providers. Uh, Volkswagen, which is another example of an industrial cloud, which is, again, which originally started with an industrial cloud for in-house work, but has now been rolled out to even their service providers. The advantage that Volkswagen, of course, has is that this was devel developed with the uh, IT company of Porsche, MHP, uh, but it's now available as a, actually as a, as a SaaS to anyone who, who, wants to, who wants to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, again, on the, on the warehousing piece, which is I think many of, many of you also have been part of that revolution in India, uh, which is the large scale automation, not just again small scale pilots, but really large scale automation in terms of uh, usage of uh, uh, robotics, uh, reducing error rates, better fill rates, uh, faster picking, uh, much efficient in and out from the warehousing, ultimately improving the per square foot productivity of the, uh, of the warehouses, which obviously translates to, translates to benefits on the line. So again, these are, these are just, uh, by no means are these exhaustive examples, by no, by no means uh, are these intended to say that, uh, you know, these are necessarily the North Stars at the moment. These are just illustrations. Uh, and by also no means are these examples that are only to say that it's not happening in India. A lot of it is also happening in our own country. Uh, but the importance of uh, bringing it here is uh, for, for specifically the OEMs that you see here, is that all of them run global supply chains. So for them, 
all of you or many of you will be a part of some part of their supply chains, either as delivering for part of their uh, business or for, let's say, the entirety of uh, you know so any of any of uh, their lines or businesses. Uh, and sooner or later, uh, this will become mainstream in India if it's not already. I'm sure a lot of it is already. And you all, as the uh, as the leading lights from a service provider point of view, also have a role to play in working with your OEMs to figure out operating models which are beneficial to both parties, uh, to making sure that the credit is shared, but also the cost is shared uh, if it comes to, for example, for sustainability or for technology. Uh, and when it comes to managing demand, uh, there is, let's say, enough trust available on both parties uh, that it is not that the entire risk of managing is actually passed to the service providers, whereas the OEM just, you know, uh, 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 there is uh, no responsibility in terms of how they uh, take care of what they are supposed to, uh, supposed to do. Uh, so some of these will become, uh, I mean, all of these are anyway mainstream conversations, so it's not, none of it is, uh, you know, new or uh, game-changing, but it's important to acknowledge that uh, as the industry, we will actually shape some of this thinking, you know, year, two years, three years to come, while navigating a slightly turbulent uh, environment and a slightly turbulent sales uh, picture. India continues to be a leading light uh, from a growth perspective, uh, but we all have responsibilities beyond our country. We are not, all of us are not necessarily delivering just for country uh, clients in this country, but also beyond, beyond this. And to that extent, we have to be also be cognizant of where the global supply chains are, are going. Uh, so that was the thought process in which the themes uh, were developed for this, and I thought I'll just give you a little bit of a teaser of what's to come for the rest of the day. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you all for, for uh, listening in, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions if, if they do come. Thank you. Thank you. I think an excellent uh, preview to all of us in terms of what is uh, the major theme of the day that we are all here <coughs> to to discuss and take back learnings and action, those insights. Now may I request uh, Mr. Kiran Vaidya to uh, give his starting remarks. Good morning all. First, happy Engineers Day. I know many of the engineers are sitting in this uh, hall. Respected dignitaries on the dais, I'm really happy to uh, be a part of this CII Logistics Supply Chain Conference. I'm representing Auto Cluster Development and Research Institute here in Chinchwad, Pune. Uh, some of you uh, may not be knowing the background of this institute or uh, the in five minutes I'll just share the activities what we do. This institute is basically a government funded initiative, a section 8 company which was established in the year 2006 and 7. The intent was to support the small scale companies for their prototype development, testing, inspection. Uh, actually right from a designing point of view to uh, display. So all things under one roof, that was the concept. Fantastic facility we have in Chinchwad area. And these have been operational since 2006. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, sir mentioned that I am having experience of around 25 years in the industry and that too in supply chain. I think that may be the reason the uh, authorities thought to call me on this dais. So, but the scenario is totally different. Maybe 5-10 years back the definition challenges and the uh, aspirations of uh, supply chain in that too particularly logistics were totally different. Now the things are changed like anything. As we all know after pandemic things are rapidly changing. That to a specific automotive industries and the technological disruptions which is happening all over. People are talking about EVs. EVs right from a bicycle to uh, trucks and buses. So all the vehicles moving on the road, they are going for a change in fuel, change in technology, change in comfort, change in safety. And we hear from our customers. Today we are serving more than 500 uh, MSMEs all put together. Majority of them are automotive sector. At least 20, 25% are non-automotive. If you uh, say compare like 80, 85% are, are small scale companies basically. But 15 to 20% are still tier 1 and few of the OEMs when they have some issues they come to us. Now, for particularly, uh, I, I hope the audience is uh, majority from the logistics part of it or a manufacturing also, uh, just for my uh, this thing, so that I'm trying to plug in the information or the sharing what I want to make here and the 
content and the topic so that there should not be any mismatch. As far as logistics is concerned, yes, there, there are going to be a very interesting things coming forward. Because two days back when I was attending ACMA annual conference in Delhi, I am uh, hearing Sri Nitin Gadkari ji talking about changes, infrastructure development and the things which they are expecting from the automotive component manufacturers. He is very much stressing on the need of collaborating with government, taking the help and joining the hands to have a more uh, sustainable and uh, we can say EV-based uh, infrastructure as far as logistics is concerned. At the end, he was also appealing to the audience if that they can join and uh, to form a ring route or kind of a road separately for the electrical vehicles of buses and trucks. That was the interesting concept they are working on. They may be having some trials somewhere in India. But the kind of activities in the road infrastructure and on, in automotives, which is happening currently, is very interesting. For all of the uh, people sitting in this uh, room, I must tell you that as far as small companies are concerned, OEMs are concerned, or government is concerned, everybody is curious on the developmental part of uh, the automotive industry. We know the figures in the manufacturing GDP, automotive industries contribute 49%. So these figures are very much, uh, very much interesting for us so that the overall logistics from a small scale company to OEM and to back to the consumer that should operate in a very good way. As far as institutional part is concerned, I must tell you that uh, we are also associated with ARAI. They are one of our board members and the information what we get from ARAI is that today more than 500 startups, they are registered with them. We, they are trying to have their EVs uh, on the road. Majority of them are two-wheelers. You know, we really don't know the names of the three-wheeler EV manufacturers. They are here in Maharashtra only because I am attending the various uh, exhibitions in Aurangabad, in Pune and in some other places. So I came to know that there are many people who are trying to convert the three-wheeler, that too particularly of uh, goods carrier kind of a thing. So there are people who are curious, whatever the background is, but people want to go for uh, electrical vehicle. That is the theme, I must tell you, which I'm hearing from many days. As far as auto cluster is concerned, uh, we have a variety of verticals which are supporting to the industry. One which, which is having a prototype development, like we have a 3D printing machines, we have testing facilities, we have uh, rubber and polymer test divisions, and all our, our labs are NABL certified so that there is an assurance to the uh, customer whatever the service is availing. Apart from that, there is a demand from the industry that we should start the electrical vehicle component testing facility. So with the help of ARAI and MCCIA, Maratha Chamber of Commerce, Industries and Agriculture, we all know, that two big organization helping auto cluster to establish these facilities and which are coming very soon. In next six months time, we'll be having that infrastructure within our premises. Also, by definition, uh, the commissioner of PCMC is the chairman of our institute. So there is a direct support available as far as the local corporation and other uh, government uh, uh, bodies are concerned. So uh, in short, I must tell you that innovations are happening at our place also because it is a research institute. We also do a reverse engineering activities. I don't know how much those detailed engineering activities related to automotive will be suitable to this audience. But for your interest, logistics related things. As I mentioned, people when they have a, a, say a auto show in Delhi, there is a rush time for us because people want to develop their product in a quick time so that they will fix that to the vehicle and they will display the vehicle in the showroom and the exhibition so that there is a demand. As far as impact of our auto cluster activities is concerned, I must tell you that in a year, roughly we do more than uh, 10,000 different type of tests and uh, activities and product development activities. So on that basis, there is a definite growth, which we measure normally uh, amplifying effect of our services. So there is a growth. We are situated, located in a place where Chakan, Bhosri, Talegaon, all these industrial uh, corridor is there. Many OEMs are there, automotive OEMs and uh, linked with uh, them, all the ancillaries, uh, ancillaries, sorry. So all these companies, they are trying to be, 
trying to match the speed of the OEM so that their product will be sold at a better price and better quality. And for that, they come to auto cluster and take help. Like we have auto cluster in Pune, there are clusters in Nasik and Aurangabad city as well. But uh, the, the formation is different, but the intent is same to support the small companies. Recently, when we have uh, one activity of supporting the industry, there is a thought in our board like what we are going to do with the uh, startups. So with the help of Smart City, Auto Cluster has established a startup incubation center where we are encouraging the young entrepreneurs to come forward and start their own business, convert their idea into business. So that activity is also in a full swing. Last week, we had a startup conclave in our auditorium where there is a participation of nearly 100 startups and uh, various uh, engineering and management students from various institutions and universities. So the idea is to make a uh, appeal or make a comfortable environment in this particular region so that startup culture will grow. In our startup, we have conducted, say, hackathon, then pitch fest, and the shark tank kind of activity where there is a good response. All the winners, they are... Uh, they will be discussed again for their idea of the product or service they are offering and we are incubating them and giving them guidance uh, from the industry. We are giving them the infrastructure, the mentoring support, the industry connect. There are things which are helping them to grow. Normally we have 18 months of period for such a type of startups in our premises. Apart from them, we have association with various institutions, universities, we are trying to have an industry academia partner for skill development activities. But that may not be the right uh, topic for your, your interest here. But as far as this supply chain is concerned, that to automotive supply chain, the things will be more interesting going forward because of the changing technology, changing demand. And, uh, you know, the uh, earlier speaker told about three challenges about sustainability, about fluctuations in the demand and um, uh, long-term plans. So these three plans which we are experiencing with our customers that will, be the, that will be there for all the logistics people also in the future. But I'm sure with good cooperation with the uh, customer, good coordination, understanding their demand, instead of always a reactive mode, if you go and talk to them and understand their demands and plan accordingly, that will ease the burden of cost on all the people here. So thank you, thanks again for inviting me to this uh, forum and uh, I'll be happy to help all of you and I also appeal all of you, if you are not visited our facility, do come to that place that may be useful to you in your future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karan. May I request Mr. Avinash to give his opening remarks? So, <clears throat> very good morning, honorable uh, dignitaries on the dais and uh, esteemed participants here. It's really uh, a pleasure for me to be amongst you and uh, share my thoughts. So, um, I'm with Bosch and uh, spend most of my uh, time in uh, manufacturing. And manufacturing is a small part of supply chain. Yeah. So. I'm not a logistic expert and neither I'm a supply chain expert, but I have a lot of lessons learned. And today I will cover uh, uh, this aspect, uh, what I have seen uh, in automotive supply chain. And uh, I do not have any PowerPoint slides. So I, <laughs> from PowerPoint, I will come to the point. <laughs> so, <laughs> so first of all, uh, today's topic, uh, so, uh, navigating through uh, changing demand environment, yeah. So, demand is the most uh, <coughs> important part of supply chain. If there is no demand, supply chain is dead. And uh, everything depends on demand and uh, navigating through this changing demand is uh, very, very important. But uh, some aspects on these two through words like demand and uh, supply chain. So the first part, what uh, we recently have realized, whether uh, we call it as a supply chain or we call it as a value chain. Yeah, finally, um, we deliver value to the end customer and uh, there is a chain, uh, source, make, deliver, and either we uh, create value or we add value and we finally work together to protect value. Lot of uh, 
thoughts were shared by my colleagues here, how sustainability is important, efficiency is important. And when it comes to uh, encompassing all these aspects, I, we, uh, we are con fully convinced that it is finally a value chain and uh, it would be more appropriate uh, to uh, respect it much more than just calling it a supply chain. Second important part is uh, demand. Of course, uh, we always say that uh, uncertainty is the most uh, certain certainty of the life. Yeah, uh, so uh, demand is uh, always varying. No, there are so many algorithms, yeah. Uh, there are mathematical models, there are data analytics, even people have put machine learning. And finally, when it comes to really uh, asking what will be my, the demand next week, yeah, then uh, the person has to apply a lot of his own contribution in addition to all the latest algorithms uh, uh, which are available uh, as a mathematical model. So uh, one cannot take away the learnings, one cannot take away the experience, one cannot take away the human aspect uh, when it comes to um, finally talking the demand. But uh, demand is one side, like I said. Uh, why it is important? Finally, demand sets the rhythm uh, of the supply chain. Yeah? It's like a pacemaker. Um, I always, uh, when I talk to my logistic colleagues uh, who are doing the customer order planning, how important their job is. If they set a wrong tone, the entire uh, value chain will be working on a wrong tone. And if they set, set a right tone, and if they set a right rhythm, then the entire value chain will be really benefited in terms of operational excellence, uh, efficiency, and so on. But finally, when the demand gets uh, converted into, let us say, actual production schedules, actual sourcing schedules, source make deliver come into the picture. And <clears throat> over the years, uh, industry has really uh, worked a lot upon how do we uh, bring excellence uh, into the um, whole value chain. Toyota production system came, many industries like Bosch, we had our own Bosch production system. Daimler and Mercedes, they have their own production system. It was required because uh, there, are very, um, uh, there are many elements which you can't copy just from Toyota because their way of life, it is also a cultural aspect. And when it comes to adapting it to your industry, there is some adaption required, but fundamental principles do not vary. And using these techniques over the years, a lot of things happened, just-in-time happened, e-commerce happened, SAPs came, ERPs came, and some kind of a discipline improvement has happened, yeah? If I look into uh, the uh, value chain or those, those days supply chain, when I joined Bosch many years before, everything was manual, there were huge boards, people were tracking manually, and now uh, there are no manual uh, tracking just ask for a data, log on to the system, you will get everything. This evolution has really contributed a lot in making our uh, value chain in automotive industry really, um, I would say, efficient, good, and so on. And that's the result that India is now one of the leading autom automotive producer, third largest. And uh, uh, it is not the point where we stop. But when it comes to, uh, let us say, efficiency and sustainability, all those improvements, uh, these kaizens or small improvements, they are important, they are necessary, and they must be carried out. But if you look into, let's say, disruptive improvements, yeah? Disruptive improvements have happened when uh, some big initiatives at the national level were taken. And the latest example, I would say, is uh, GST implementation. Everybody knows that by one t reform in this country, the logistic time to travel has improved by 30%. Yeah. A truck which was taking, um, let's say, th three to four days or four to five days uh, crossing multiple states boundaries from Pune to Delhi, yeah, and uh, carrying out formalities at each state boundary, standing in a queue, 
Sometimes one document missing, truck gets stuck. And one reform of GST has eliminated all those stoppages. And now, which was taking four to five days, it just takes less than three days. Yeah. And, th and this particular improvement which has happened is remarkable, is felt by everybody, is, is benefiting everybody. Now, qu <coughs> question is, uh, is it enough? Yeah. Surely not enough. Yeah. But Government of India is doing a lot on uh, Gati Shakti initiatives. Many of us have heard. But uh, my appeal here to CII and also uh, to the fraternity that um, when GST was uh, implemented, there were many, many stakeholder inputs taken. That what are the pain points? What could be the real way of operating? How could be the chapters laid? How could be the, uh, how could be the slabs and so on? Similarly, for Gati Shakti initiative also, we need a co-participation. Government alone cannot do, yeah? And all the industries, including, I would say, my example, we look inward. Uh, what, how can I improve my transit time? How can I improve my supplier? How can I uh, impl uh, reduce my logistic cost? It's it very much important, required, and must be done. But most important, when you see India as a country, India is called as low-cost uh, uh, country. That means our operating costs are lower, but you will be surprised in terms of the total logistic cost, India is not lowest. And why? Because in spite of having low cost of labor or low cost of transport, we have our efficiency of overall logistic in the country is very, very low. We do not have uh, holistic uh, um, approach and he, see, on, on one side we have a, uh, let's say, situation and taking, instead of taking it ne you know, negatively that it is bad and so on, let's take it positively and call it as a area of the biggest potential. Imagine if 2%, absolute 2% of the logistic cost is improved, that, is contrib that will contribute to the 2% of the overall profit in the automotive, entire automotive supply chain. And many times when we suffer with the problems, we take the problem as part of the life. We, we accept it as part of the life. Like, like in uh, Pune, we say, okay, traffic, we, have, we take it as a part of the life and we plan 30 minutes extra to reach. Yeah? But question is, uh, uh, can we do something about it? Yeah? And uh, many of you might have heard that we do um, like a Toyota production system, uh, we do value stream mapping, value stream design. There are excellent examples, professors, experts are available, how to do a perfect mapping and how to do a better value stream design. But now time has come that we do a value stream design at the national level, crossing even beyond that. There is a concept and if we do this collectively, all this potential which I was talking about, yeah, this potential can be tapped and it is not the benefit to every single industry, it's a benefit to the country. And there is no bigger work than you do it for your country. Second aspect what I would like to cover today is uh, uh, sustainability or the robustness of the supply chain. Yeah. Recent example was also a pandemic. When the pandemic came, lockdown happened, all of us, including you, me, everybody tried to, let's say, look inward. How do I protect my cash? People started saying, cash is the king. And everybody, uh, let's say, uh, went into a very, very conservative mode. And uh, of course, not everybody. Some people thought that if I hold everything to, to myself, maybe uh, I will uh, sustain longer. But do I sustain longer without my ecosystem? No. Yeah? I'm, I'm only a part of the ecosystem. I can't survive without my suppliers. I can't survive without my customer. I have no identity otherwise. Yeah? We are chain. And uh, there are many good examples uh, of various industries, including Bosch. In those days, first we said that our small suppliers who, who were really facing a lot of heat, we have not only uh, paid them immediately what was 
payable so that they can sustain. In, in many, many examples, we have even given them the advances uh, so that they are able to restart their industries. Same, same is the case, there was a lot of talk on migrant workers. We have, <coughs> we have told all our my, uh, outstation uh, workers that please do not leave the town. You will get in your, in your place of residence two times the meal packed and delivered to you. Yeah? And uh, because uh, they are very important players and whole country suffered when the lockdown was lifted, how to get back my people. Those who took care of the people during this lockdown period, they did not suffer because they were there. They were there. So, um, like we say, the strength of the chain uh, depends upon uh, the weakest link. And the, the weakest link may not be inside, the weakest link could be outside. And uh, believe me, when the industry lockdown was lifted, uh, permission number one in Chakan industry was Bosch because we were really prepared uh, to restart the operations. So, uh, when we call it as a value chain, we, we must think uh, not only inward, but also uh, holistic. And the <coughs> last part is also uh, strategic. Yeah? Uh, and I will again give a connecting example. After the pandemic, all of us know that uh, semiconductor crisis came, there was no automotive uh, in supplier uh, who was directly or indirectly impacted because of uh, the semiconductor crisis. Yeah? You, uh, and uh, when the semiconductor crisis came, uh, one lesson we learned, these are the giants. Some of the semiconductor companies, their turnover is uh, bigger than uh, whole state of Maharashtra and they were the cause of the entire global crisis. So like, we, like I said, know the weakest link in the chain and the weakest link is not necessarily uh, financially weak but the vulnerability was with those companies who were the giants in the world and look, uh, believe me, that when uh, a very big semiconductor supplier in Malaysia, one of the top five, I will not take the name, and when they got impacted with uh, COVID, Bosch globally, in the interest of the entire world, did so many things, including send, uh, sending uh, vaccines, sending analytical tools. Bosch also developed uh, a, a kit called Vivalitic. It was not released in India, we couldn't bring it here. But it was, uh, that time, the fastest uh, corona detection test. And we sent uh, uh, those resources even to Malaysia. Our people went inside even to restart their operations. So, uh, unless the industries who, who have uh, this bandwidth and capability, and they don't think be, uh, beyond their own, the sustainability will not be ensured and will not happen. And uh, taking this step forwards, the strategic aspects, you might have also recently heard, yeah, that Bosch has uh, even gone beyond uh, now in uh, producing the automotive parts. We will be also um, investing heavily for semiconductors. We are already a sem uh, semiconductor producer, one of the largest semiconductor producer uh, for, uh, in the automotive supplier group. But the recent uh, announcement, there were billions of euros will be invested uh, for uh, uh, future semiconductors together with the giants like NXP and uh, so many other things. There is already a press note available, I won't repeat. The message here is, uh, it is not a fun uh, that uh, these industries make money. Our expertise is not in that direction. But finally, a strategic call was taken that uh, in the larger interest of the automotive supply chain, we need the presence at uh, tier one level, we need the expertise, and uh, this call was taken. So, <coughs> just to conclude my <coughs> message, I would say, um, first, think holistic and think beyond boundaries. Protect the weakest link in the chain, 
first identify the link and then protect it and uh, consider supply chain as value chain either by creating a value if not then adding the value if not minimum protecting the value thank you thank you mr avinash chintawar may i request dilraj dabole to give his opening remarks respected dignitaries on dais honorable shri devan parboji member ci national committee and ceo stellar value chain shri anshuman sina partner keetan consulting solution mr kiran vaidya md auto cluster development and research institute pimpri chintwad honorable shri avinash chintanwar md bosch chassis system uh, and vinit masgaukar member ci national first of all dear participants and honorable dignitaries i am very grateful that you have invited me here to share my thoughts sir uh, as rightly pointed out by anshuman sinha ji that after russia ukraine war the supply chain has some disruptive effect as there on supply chain and if you are following latest news latest trends you will see ki how better india is placed how in in bright spot we have been placed if you are following like i'm not comparing with the pakistan i'm not comparing with the sri lanka i'm comparing with the us i'm comparing with the eu sir imagine do, doing business in the country where interest rates are in two digit and india repo rate if you are uh, observing repo rate it has been kept stable for last 4 to 6 months if you are following our co consumer price inflation figure it is around 6% although not tolerable within rbi's limit sir if you are observing our foreign exchange it is 600 billion dollar and if you are observing our gdp growth rate it is projected that india will be growing at a 7% rate for this current fiscal year so in a sense i will say india is in a bright spot and in a sense i will say we are outlier also the although the picture is gloom in the worldwide we are growing we are growing with a breakneck i will say much faster way uh, mr devan pabar was talking about china one policy so if you are seeing china one policy why india is or india could be the most favored destination for the investment so we can talk about see one thing is that we have rule of law we have democracy we have competitive labor uh, and moreover we have independent judiciary also so if you are comp so if you have to th think about india so i will say india is still preferred destination there is a lot of potential automotive industry is, means it is contributing lot to india's export but there is still potential which need to be tapped and that potential will be tapped when whenever there will be the partnership between as uh, mr ravinash chintanwar sir was rightly said there has to be partnership between government industry research and academia institutions mr ravinash chintanwar sir was giving example of gst sir i am from the generation where we used to wonder why there is a long queue outside municipal border I, I was from nearby place in Pune, and whenever I used to come in the Katras, I used to see huge, huge queue of like trucks and lorries. Same, if you are going to Mumbai, uh, just cross Washi Toll Naka, and you will observe that there is a huge queue of again trucks and lorries. It is contributing to congestion, noise pollution, and like uh, delays also. So, but after advent of GST, this, like sir has said, 30% of logistic has been reduced. now you come to sir i will want to give you another example there was one famous document known as are if you are manufacturer you will know that if you have to remove goods from your own factory you needed approval from the excise inspector from your jurisdiction authority these were the supply chain bottlenecks and these have been removed with the advent of gst so there is a, as sir has said rightly pointed out that there is a lot of potential for improving our logistic our improving our efficiency of our logistics and it will not be like initiative led by government it will not be initiative led by industry it has to be together like both have to come together and both have to walk together then only it can happen sir uh, as we are talking about policy i am and i am from the dgft director general foreign trade so most of you who are doing importing or exporting or into the business you must be knowing dgft sir uh, i just want to highlight in what way dgft can contribute in your supply chain so uh, it will i will take another 2 3 minutes that's it uh, first of all if you want to import or export you need to have import export code 
that that is a mandatory requirement without import export code you are not allowed to import and you cannot import that is also thing so after you want to set up a unit or you want to enter into supply chain so if you are an intermediate good producer or you are want to pr produce finished goods so you would be sourcing your inputs raw material or catalyst or oil something whatever you want to import so dgft provides you ab initio exemption from all the duties levable at the time of import and this scheme is very popular i am sure most of you must be using it it is a advance authorization scheme sir so see the incidence of duty average incidence of duty at the time of import would be 30 to 35% and it is not only quantitative measures or duty you have to look apart from some certain non duty measures or like it is called as technical barriers to trade for example you are autom at someone from automotive industry they must require steel and if you want to import a steel it is like bit cumbersome and bit onerous procedure after quality control order has come into the force but there is a one exception in quality control order if you read the definition first clause that that is that if you are importing for the purpose of export you don't need to your supplier don't need to have a bis registration so these schemes dgft schemes advance authorization scheme not only gives you eodb from the only from the incidence of duties from other compliance also whatever compliance you need that also like you will be like you will be freed from all these compliances now suppose you have like huge orders or you are confident that you can make more export you want to set up new unit or you want to expand already existing capacity in that case dgft provides that you want to import capital goods or you want to source the capital goods from the local uh, from domestic market dgft gives you ab initio exemption from all duties provided you do six times export of six time duty save value the scheme is very popular again epcg sir so not only we are look, uh, looking at only a regulatory environment our department is also reaching out to the potential budding exporter and existing uh, exporters and this year every year there is to be policy policy used to be five years document like 400 policy 2009 40 then 400 policy 15 20 this year it is a policy only 2023 there is no end so in this initiative we have lowered the threshold for status holder but we have put one responsibility on the all the major exporter like they have to groom there is a six weeks training program every status holder has to groom has to like uh, hold the hand of new and budding exporter so that he will become conversant he will come to know how to export so whenever you will be benefiting everybody will be benefiting from the india's uh, whatever we are developing whatever gdp growth but the issue is that the growth should trickle or the effect should spill over to the marginalized section also and to the last it should uh, it should so that is the region dgft has also started this uh, program for the status holder also sir we have started rupee payment for globalization of indian national rupee it will definitely save your transaction cost i already told you how can you save your transaction cost i and i would like to have one session with the cia or or the exporter on how dgft can contribute in saving your transaction cost your cost of capital also if you are borrowing you might be knowing packing credit a pre shipment and post shipment packing credit we have famous scheme interest equalization scheme here again ab initio exemption is given by bank in uh, in form of 2% subvention for merchant exporter and 3% subvention for msme manufacturer exporter so just to like you should become competitive in vis-a-vis -vis developed countries where interest rates are low vis-a-vis -vis india this scheme is being brought by government of india another thing is that we are not focusing we are going at the granular level we are going to district earlier it was like national then state now every district is being we are preparing district export action plan and the best thing is that pune's district export action plan has been prepared chairman is a collector i am a vice i am a co chairman and there are other industry people academic uh, people from academia institution they are preparing and the we are uh, we are trying to find out the solution how we can pluck the low hanging fruits and how export from every district can grow so we are trying to identify what are the bottlenecks what are supply chain issues in the uh, every district and we have around 15 districts in our jurisdiction so to tell you about my office my i'm take i'm with the proud i can say that my office is entirely online nobody has to come to my office to get any certificate any authorization from dgft it is the process is entirely online end to end and sir going forward uh i would be like 
very much i would very much like to come here mo again and again and i think it is just like it should not be just like an annual event it should be like uh, anyone is having any issues or anything else they can anytime write to pune dash uh, our email id is pune dash dgft at the rate gov dot in mobile uh, mo contact number zero two zero two triple four nine five nine eight i'm just giving it because i know all of you may not be called but there will be some people who will be interested in exporter and i will be very much happy to help them and if you have any suggestion with respect to automotive supply chain not only automotive supply chain in any other respect if there is any compliance which is compliance burden or some funding is required in any case so you kindly write to us we will definitely take up one suggestion i have received from cia is that export obligation for green energy vehicle and battery energy ve battery operated vehicle it should be reduced sir it's a, i will say it is a very welcome suggestion i will take, definitely take up with the our dgft headquarter sir i once again thank you that you and um, i once again thank you for inviting me for sparing your precious time thank you very much thank you mr dilliraj tabule may i request vinith majgaonkar to give the concluding remarks good morning everybody as we come towards the conclusion of the first session uh i am more excited about uh what i'm about to hear in the subsequent sessions in this first session basically uh, i think that the pivot that we are trying to hit upon is customer experience and customer experience has become so important especially in the past few years and more so ever post covid i think that supply chain has the biggest role to play in enhancing a customer experience for our customers whether it is sales of automotive or aftermarket and i truly believe that supply chain efficiency is going to be one of the biggest differentiators of delivering a great customer experience so mr anshuman already has spoken about uh, the volatility the challenges of sustainability and the need of technology uh, you know in in delivering these promises global gdp remains a challenge but india has a good reason to celebrate that you know our gdp seems to be an outlier and we we hope to do better than the global gdp kiran ji highlighted about the automotive cluster here and various activities that are taken up and i think that most of you will reach out to him and see you know what what benefits can be derived mutually with the cluster it was great to hear such initiative happening in pune here avinash ji redefined supply chain as value chain and that's the greatest compliment that supply chain can get and that's the paradigm shift that we must all have while addressing supply chain it's one of the most important aspect of the value chain his second point was predicting demand and while we are toying a lot with predictive analytics machine learnings uh, ai algorithms and as we all know that amazon has already about 3 years ago played with algorithms you know where they start moving the shipments before you even place the order based on the user behavior that they see so big data plays a lot of important role in 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 this kind of you know predictive analytics but yes today a person with the right business acumen the right ability to predict is indispensable and it will remain so because where the ability of predictive analytics and machine learning ends the ability of humans to predict starts and that was a very key point at the same time i think he also highlighted the partnership between government and uh, private sector and so did uh, diliraj ji highlighted this this partnership and i believe that we have come into a new era where as we can see able government officers like diliraj ji and the private sector you know there is an invitation from the government officers to come meet 
discuss together and also you know participate in the government decisions i have seen a lot of examples of the government officers reaching out to private sector and about 3 4 years ago there was a bit of hesitance uh, while talking to the government officers but I but i think in the last 3 years that hesitance has gone and people have been making their attempts to reach out both ways i think that should culminate to its next level where we actually derive a synergy between government and private sector the way it is done in let's say germany and the best part avinash ji was from toc the weakest link that you defined and the enlightening enlightening moment was that the weakest link could be outside your supply chain the weakest link in the chain could be outside the chain and i'm sure goldrat would have really complimented that um uh, yeah finally uh, dilraj ji the advantage of india that you stated the invitation that you have give, extended to all the participants here to come and uh, talk to you your people a special session that you have volunteered to deliver and i have also spoken with uh, dr banu to also kind of you know try and arrange that very soon let's hope that we have it and he also given he has also given us a glimpse of the benefits of uh, dgft uh, you know that we all can uh, uh, achieve or benefit from with that uh, i would turn to the word of thanks to the sponsors of the event and uh, so i would profusely like to thank first of all the dignitaries on the dais and the dignitaries of the dais uh, to spend your time here invest your time here and uh, i would like to thank the sponsors of the event uh, namely tvs supply chain solutions armstrong dematic horizon industrial parks dp world we express safe express total group and kearney so thank you all for joining this event and i hope you have a wonderful day one last small uh, instruction if i may say in in the puneri tone and it, it pune can't you know do without it is that this device that we normally carry often has a button on the side here with which you can switch off the rings uh, if this button doesn't exist on the device then you might go into the settings and try to you know switch off the rings uh, if you cannot manage that we have some volunteers there who can who will be very happy to help you with that so hope to have a great session today thank you so much thank you mr anit with this i think we break and we conclude our session looking forward to interacting for the whole day thank you